I can remember a time when I was at the YMCA, my mother wanted me to uh, get swimming lessons. I'm probably nine years old. The teacher said, uh, Greenewald, yeah, uh, your dad's the quack, right? I said, well, I don't think so. And she says, well, no, 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 he, he's not a real doctor, he's a chiropractor. We were going to play softball with the children in the neighborhood. Phyllis had the bat and the ball and I had a mitt and I was waiting for her. She came out, plopped down on the cement next to me and said, my daddy said your daddy's bad. My daddy says your daddy's a quack. The sons and daughters of chiropractors all across the country, they can tell you the stories where their daddy was in backroom conversations or whisper campaigns was called the quack. You know, there's the son of the quack or the daughter of the quack. So we had that social stigma that we had to deal with. If helping somebody with a natural approach to health care versus a addictive, unsafe, potentially fatal approach is quackery, they call me a quack every day of the week. This is the town of Houma, Louisiana, one of the most southernmost parts to the west of New Orleans by about 50 miles. This is where my dad stopped the car when he drove down from Davenport, Iowa after chiropractic school. And this is where he began his practice. It was one of four states that had yet licensed the profession. He didn't realize that it was also gonna be the last state to license the profession. And the reason being is that the AMA political medicine at that time had a committee who were charged with containing and eliminating the chiropractic profession. The chairman of that committee happened to be from New Orleans. He wielded great influence in the legislature and, uh, and, and in politics in our state. And that's why Louisiana was the last state and, and why chiropractors in Louisiana were especially demonized. My father was a really kind, gentle, sweet guy. Um, but really powerful in the fact that he knew what he believed in and was passionate about it and uh, was not willing to compromise under any circumstances. I found at his funeral, for example, that he and three other chiropractors had to fight for licensure in chiropractic. Um, and what most people don't realize is that chiropractors went to jail for chiropractic, some of them for over a year's period of time, because they refused to practice under medical licenses forcing state legislatures to enact chiropractic laws so they could practice. One of these four chiropractors that my dad was a part of, they actually had their offices firebombed during the course of the things they fought for. In the first half of the last century, 12,000 chiropractors were arrested over 15,000 times for supposedly practicing medicine with a license. Chiropractors were hounded, they were beaten up in their front yards, they were insulted publicly. We get great results, but we have a bad image. And the image is in our own doing. It's not self-inflicted. What it is, it's this multi-million dollar, century-long defamation campaign the AMA did against us. At the Chicago headquarters of the American Medical Association is the spokesman for the majority of its 110,000 doctor members, able publicist Dr. Morris Fishbein, who opposes any radical departure from long-established medical practice. It's interesting, whereas racism and sexism and anti-Semitism have diffuse origins, you can trace medical racism, if you will, back to one man. His name was Morris Fishbein. He owned the AMA from 1924 to 1949. He was its executive director, the editor of its journals. He was dubbed the medical Mussolini by his contemporaries because he was such an effective tyrant. We insist that the practice of medicine is a doctor's problem. The doctor is the only one entitled by training, by experience, and by law to take care of the sick. Medicine is still a profession. It must never become a business or a trade, never the subservient tool of a governmental bureaucracy. What made him powerful was that he jumped in bed with the tobacco industry in the 1930s. Those of us old enough remember medical doctors endorsing tobacco and their ads were in magazines and newspapers on television. And for 56 years, the, the tobacco industry funded the AMA and its schools and research. The medical Mussolini, he wrote 22 books, was syndicated in 800 newspapers, and he had two hatreds, chiropractors in any, any alternative healthcare and any kind of governmental 
health care insurance. In 1949, when he was forced out of office, Harper's Magazine, in an article, said that he turned the AMA from a panty waste organization into the most terrifying trade association on earth. They're like the fourth branch of government, but they're self-appointed, non-elected, and they basically can do whatever they want, which is to create a medical monopoly, which is why we have a health care crisis in America today. That was an environment that my dad and many other people were practicing in. And it took a lot of courage, it took a lot of conviction, and a lot of belief in what they were doing to stay the course. Not only was it tough making a living back at that time, but it was tough socially and culturally. My older brother was killed in Vietnam. He was the first Louisiana soldier killed in Vietnam. And he's on the wall in the Vietnam Memorial is number 100. Soon after my brother was killed, my mom just went into a depression. She took it very hard and she wouldn't leave the house. My dad finally got her out one night. He says, Pat, come with me, we're going to bowl. He bowled once a week with a group of people in a bowling team. And mom said, okay, I need to start getting out. And within 30 minutes, I recall them coming back home. And mom had been visibly upset. She was still crying. She went into her room. And I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, is it, is it Raymond, my brother? And dad said, no. He says, there was a medical doctor who happened to be on the other team that we were bowling against. And he made a big stink that he wasn't going to bowl if a chiropractor was going to be on the other team. Your mother in her state she kind of went off on him. She says, I just lost my son in defense of this country. I gave my oldest son up, and you're going to treat my husband and my family this way? She was really upset about it, and, uh, and Mom talked about that until almost her dying days. She used to always remember that one incident and how cruel and insensitive medicine could be to her and her husband. Part of this contain and eliminate strategy was they label chiropractors unscientific cultists. And that was in an era where the cultists were, were pretty nasty people. Chiropractors were put right into that boat. Cults back then were Charles Manson, and the evil that he prevailed on those people in California. And then you had a guy like Jim Jones. Made all those people drink Kool-Aid. And they all died. It was a mass suicide. And they labeled chiropractors the same as they labeled those types of people. He had no idea at all that this new profession that he loved and he knew he was helping a lot of people with was going to be labeled a cult. Normal people in society would almost revolt when they saw a chiropractor coming because they thought these people were crazy. They, they were loons. They were cultists. That's what political medicine did to him and to all of his colleagues. Millions of Americans swear by chiropractors and many physicians swear at them, claiming that chiropractors are unscientific and potentially very dangerous. My guests tonight represent both sides, and they're here to discuss what chiropractors can and cannot do for you. Please meet them now. First, Dr. Stephen Barrett is a psychiatrist, a consumer advocate, and a medical writer. Dr. Louis Sportelli has been a chiropractor for 19 years in rural Pennsylvania. Are chiropractors doctors? Do you have a medical degree? No, and I don't want a medical degree. Well, if I did, well, I'd go to med school, but my, well, I, I'm, I have a doctor of chiropractic degree. You cracked. We manipulate Crack. the spine very specifically and very delicately. What do you manipulate it for? What kind of conditions do you treat? We don't treat conditions. I've just said that. You don't we treat, treat anything? The, body. the fact of the matter remains is there are functional angina cases that go to their cardiologists, have had their cardiovascular system checked, have proven to be normal. They still retain their functional angina, which are fearful constricting chest pains. They go to a chiropractor, they have their dorsal spine manipulated, and by God, you know what happens? Nothing. What happens is they lose their functional That's what angina. You say, isn't it? That's what's said by thousands of people, incidentally. This is one of the problems, David. I will answer any letter that comes and send information about chiropractors. If you're going to go to see one, you better know what you're getting into. The AMA has focused on maintaining a monopoly on health care. People have a hard time understanding that because the authority given to the AMA is almost, uh, as some folks call it, the fourth branch of government without duly being elected. They have just incredible authority. Think about it. You need to be born with an MD and you need to die with an MD. And you need an MD 
every place in between. I separate, and I, and I want to I wanna make this very clear. I separate political medicine from clinical medicine. Uh, I, I am not in any way, shape, or form wanting to suggest that, that the guys that practice medicine in the field today are not good people. They don't care about their, about their patients. They certainly do. But the political side of medicine is a whole different story. They want to maintain a monopoly on healthcare. And this has been evidenced over the years by their actions against every group that has attempted to infringe upon their monopoly. Case in point, the chiropractors. Men of medicine, doctors, think that chiropractic is a fraud and a deception. That's too simple. Virtually in the early 1900s of this country, when chiropractic was in its formative years, had there been exaggerations of chiropractic claims? Certainly. Were there people who were evangelical in their fervor for chiropractic? Certainly. Did chiropractors themselves make overstatements? Certainly. But the fact of the matter remains, they sought out chiropractic as a viable alternative to medical care because they weren't getting results under medical care. Chiropractic became then a threat. Therefore, they were opposed to chiropractic. The AMA in 1963 formed a committee on quackery whose goal and objective was to contain and eliminate the profession of chiropractic. Think about that. So they themselves couldn't come out and attack chiropractic. So what they did was all of these American societies, the American Society of Arthritis, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, the AMA wrote, ghost wrote, position papers for every one of those organizations, basically denouncing chiropractic. And then they would say, look, the AMA is only interested in public health and service. And so look at all these organizations that, that feel the same way we do. A Dr. Sabatier from Louisiana was a member of the, what was originally called the Committee on Chiropractic. But the powers that be said that sounds too noble. Change it to Committee on Quackery. So your young medical students, the day they opened their locker, ended up with a quack pack telling the young, impressionable doctors-to-be, male and female, they were killing their patients if they allowed them to go near a doctor of chiropractic. He said, you are going to get reports from many, many of your patients that they are going to chiropractors and getting help. Say something like this, chiropractors are like little puppies, cute, but rabid. They are killers. If you were uh, an MD and you wanted to teach in a chiropractic institution, you'd soon find yourself getting a letter saying, if you teach at a chiropractic institution, forget about your career. You'll never teach again. In their ethics, they said that a medical physician could not be affiliated in any way, shape, or form, even in a civic organization. So when I joined my Lions Club in my local community, the medical physician in town had to resign. This was a very, very clever operation to systematically eliminate chiropractic from any segment of the public in terms of credibility. In the initial early stages in the 60s, we couldn't prove any of that. We knew it existed, but we couldn't prove it. So when chiropractors would say the AMA was doing this or we were under different pressure or things weren't working, people would look at us and say, you know, provide us with the evidence to show that this is happening and maybe we'll look into it. There was no evidence. And then comes the day that I recall like it was yesterday. Got a, a brown unmarked package in the mail and I took out this ream, literally 500 or some pages. I read the first couple pages and I, I, I said to myself, this can't be true. It was a day that the weight of the world literally was lifted from my shoulders as a practitioner. I couldn't imagine what was gonna happen to the entire profession. But in these documents was every single thing that we knew to be true, from copies of the Committee on Quackery documentation to all of the other clandestine things that the AMA was doing. This became dubbed sore throat 
One day I got the call from one of my brothers, my brother who was a chiropractor. He said, we have received some documents from someone purporting to be sore throat. They were copies of original documents from the American Medical Association and other medical trade associations outlining a plan to first contain and then eliminate the profession of chiropractic in the United States. Those are startling words because in criminal law, I say the highest form of proof is a confession. And there were 13 documents that said the purpose of the AMA secretly was to first contain and then eliminate the profession of chiropractic. I was astonished at the documents he showed me. Sore Throat decided that his very life might be in jeopardy, but he agreed to talk to a group of chiropractors at a seminar. The uh, guy would get on with a, a, a voice synthesizer. He was smart enough not to leave his fingerprints or his voice prints. So here was an audience prepped and listening to the speaker, and all of a sudden, sore throat comes on. And he says, I'm a medical doctor, and I've worked, worked for the AMA, AMA for, for a number, number of years. years. Approximately two years ago, I finally woke up and found myself working in the middle of a morally corrupt, politically and, and economically, economically motivated, motivated organization. Wow. Think about those words to the ears of doctors of chiropractic who've been oppressed for all these years. And in 1979, the AMA was being run from a jail cell. For those who are not familiar with this, the chairman of the board of the AMA, John Colonel, was indicted, tried, and convicted of bank fraud and conspiracy. After jailing, Colonel retained control of the AMA, sending his orders in sealed envelopes to Dr. James Sammons, executive vice president of the AMA. That's just the opening remark. Well, we said to ourselves, oh my God. What he revealed was nothing short of spectacular, much more than anybody could possibly believe was going on. He was almost challenging the chiropractor community to do something about this. You have now the data that I've gotten for you. We ought to be able to at least stop what is an illegal act. Now all we had to do was find a lawyer. And fortunately for us, we found one. I remember Jerry saying to me, my older brother, uh, Dad would kick the lid off the grave if with all this evidence uh, you didn't take it over. My father was born with what they called incurable asthma. He had uh, an inability to breathe normally. My mother got a call from her brother-in-law up in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, saying some quack has just moved into the neighborhood. And he starts with A, asthma, and goes all the way through Z, saying they can cure everything by a chiropractic adjustment. And my mother, who at the time, I wasn't alive, had five children and was fed up with staying up all night while my father rasped for air, told my father that you've got to go and see this person. And my dad said I'd sooner die in a normal fashion than see a quack. So she got up and waited until the telephone was working in, at 5 a.m., called my uncle and said, come and get him. He's not spending another night in this household. And the rest I know is a, a story, but my dad said the fellow did a running broad jump onto the middle of my back and my head and my heels collided. Uh, that was his uh, description of his first adjustment. He had uh, three more adjustments, and uh, till the day he died, no one ever knew him to have another respiratory ailment. He went from 140 pounds up to 240 pounds. He was 6'4". Correcting his asthma that he said was strangulating all the time made him want to be a chiropractor. I grew up in a household where I knew my father was helping people. I also remember my dad getting up at one in the morning on house calls 
I asked him, why in the heck are you going out at 1.30 in the morning? He said, because if the medical doctors in those communities see that their patients are being cared for a chiropractor, they will no longer care for them. And the patients have asked if I will do my house calls in the middle of the morning. Uh, I, uh, there's no way you forget those things. I've given you one one hundredth of the trash he had to live with. When I thought that most of the propaganda against the chiropractic profession had been ghostwritten in the AMA headquarters, that enraged me. Then I got to thinking about my father and my brother and my sister, who had become a chiropractor, and decided I'm going to do it notwithstanding what my partners were would say. Going up against the AMA, do you realize the tentacles that they have? And so if you're a law firm anywhere in this country, you would essentially be ostracized from having anything to do with any medical or hospital. Wow, what a burden to undertake. I don't think George realized um, what was going to happen to him in the next 17 years. We went around the country. I took 164 depositions, primarily of medical doctors, but also of state, county, and local medical societies. At first, they maintained that the documents that the sore throat had distributed were fake. But then it turned out that we found them out in the state, county, and local society files and I asked them, where'd you get them? They said, well, the AMA sent them to us. And then we asked the AMA, why don't you have all of the documents that we're finding out in the, the boonies? And their answer to me was, well, we gathered all those documents together and the janitor mistook it as garbage and disposed of it. Uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm not an idiot. We went to New Mexico and uh, the leader of the New Mexico Medical Society, a lay person, I said, I have more of your documents than you have. Why is that so? He says, well, we were told to get rid of all of our documents relating to the subject of chiropractic. I said, who told you that? He says, the AMA is sending uh, their missionaries out all over the country telling us that the chiropractors have gotten angry and are bringing lawsuits and that we would be well advised to get rid of all of our documents that directly or indirectly mention chiropractic. It was any gimmick possible to keep the public unaware. And we had evidence after evidence of how this punished the patient. During the closing arguments, the, the courtroom was jam-packed. The judge allowed the doors to be opened and people were leaning against the walls across the hall. And afterwards, I remember uh, a radiologist from California. He said, I was interested enough in this trial to fly out here and get in line. He says, if you know of any chiropractor in Orange County, California, that needs radiological assistance. I will do it for them free of charge. He said, what I have heard in these closing arguments humiliates me and makes me ashamed of my profession. The chiropractors lost the first case. There was a jury trial. And the jury trial came back after all days and maybe months of testimony and said medical doctors, they wouldn't have done such nasty things to those chiropractors just because of competition. So they found the AMA and 1900 local and county societies of medicine not guilty. And afterwards, George McAndrews told me this, that he went into the judge's chambers. And there's George by himself and maybe five or six medical lawyers. 
A and the judge says, Mr. McAndrews, are, are you going to appeal this decision? And George says, before I could answer, and my answer was going to be no, because we had no more money, the AMA lawyer said, oh, Your Honor, they can't appeal this decision. They would only lose again, and they don't have the money to fight us anymore. It's over with. At, at that time, George says he'd never seen this in his years of practicing law. The judge took out from his pocket the keys to his house. And he said, Counselor, I'll bet my house against your house that if the chiropractors appeal this decision, they will win. And George went back to his chiropractors and said, this is what the judge just said. We're going to appeal. We're going to fight. My name is George McAndrews, attorney for the plaintiffs. These are depositions of Doyle Taylor, the gentleman that had a lot to do with the Committee on Quackery. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Uh, Mr. Taylor, did the Committee on Quackery have a primary purpose? Through, uh, through the years, it evolved that probably the greatest hazard to the public health was chiropractic, and that if there was to be any emphasis by the committee placed on any single type of uh, health quackery or whatever it might be called, that, that, sh that it should be on chiropractic. Did you take any steps to prevent chiropractic colleges from obtaining affiliations with state universities for their pre-chiropractic professionals training? We certainly did. He was very arrogant and very non-knowledgeable about chiropractic, but it was like his job to discredit chiropractic. They were killing off enough people, so it didn't make any difference. Uh, do you know how many they killed off? No, I don't know. In fact, didn't you search for the number of malpractice or deaths uh, attributable to chiropractic on numerous occasions? No, I don't ever remember searching for chiropractic deaths. Uh, isn't that something you'd want to know if you were uh, making a statement that they were killing off so many people? I usually did know. You did know? Uh, what was the figure you, you were able to come up with? I, I, I have no figure that I could give you. <clears throat> Would it have been uh, useful scientific information to uh, put out a survey asking medical physicians to, to report to your committee to tell you how many patients had been killed by chiropractors? <clears throat> it might have been. <clears throat> uh, we, we had two very separate and distinct cases that were uh, of deaths resulting from chiropractic, in our judgment at least, malfeasance, the death of the child in California, and the death of the person in Florida. Okay, now you, you just said you had two. Very different cases, a okay. child, <laughs> cancer, an adult with some sort of a, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the disease. I believe it was pneumonia or a lung disease that ultimately killed him. All right, can you, you name the third one? I'm sure there were many others. Throughout the trial, it became very much apparent to me that this group at the AMA really didn't care about the welfare of the patient. Was the uh, American Medical Association, to your knowledge, concerned that members of the public were substituting chiropractic services for medical services? I, every physician that was worth his salt had more patients that he could handle anyway. Why would he want these people if they were going to chiropractors anyway? If, as Justice Holmes once said, if they're dumb enough to go to a chiropractor, go to a chiropractor, they should suffer the consequences. Uh, were there any licensed chiropractors that, that weren't practicing? I have no idea. All right. uh, I suppose they're running gas stations. They were before they went to school anyway. All right. There was a time when watching a few of those and parts of it that I just got really emotional because um, that was my profession and that was the people that uh, were affected by what he did for generations still to this day. Did you continue to condemn all chiropractors as cultists? We continued to, con to condemn chiropractic as a cult. 
as I have t said to you at least twice today, our whole program is aimed at chiropractic, the sin, not the sinners. And were chiropractors cultists? Any chiropractor who held himself out as competent to treat the broad gamut of human disease with the education and training of a chiropractor in those days was not only a cult, he was a quack. With respect to my history in chiropractic, uh, at the age of 30 as a lawyer in New Zealand, I'd never heard the word, but there was a major petition to government. Uh, chiropractic was regulated by law, but it wasn't covered within the socialized healthcare plan and patients wanted that. So a major petition went into government which resulted in a commission of inquiry to look into chiropractic. We're talking about a commission where all the evidence was given on oath in a judicial format subject to cross-examination. And so it involved not only the chiropractors giving testimony but all the other health professions too. When that was all over, a report came out that was very positive on the profession generally, that this was a profession that in its treatment and diagnostic methods was sophisticated in an area that had been overlooked otherwise in medical science. There was clear evidence of their effectiveness in the field of spinal and related pain, and for that they included headache. I found that the Commission's report was clearly, for clear reasons, very much welcomed in North America. I remember speaking at that time with uh, George McAndrews and he was in negotiations with several of the defendants for settlement at that time and he wouldn't continue those negotiations till the lawyers and the parties had actually read the New Zealand report. In the second trial, which was in front of a federal judge, uh, they had the New Zealand report where this court of inquiry had no, uh, no thought of, of exonerating chiropractic but after a testimony they said yes. Chiropractors have a place in healthcare today. This helped the, the Will case tremendously from what I understand. Things went my way. Toward the end of the trial, I believe it was Dr. Harris from Salt Lake City was on the stand and he was chairman of the board of trustees of the AMA. She said, Dr. Harris, what are you doing this weekend? He says, well, I took this weekend off because of coming out here for the trial. I've got to get back. My nurses have loaded up Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday with patients. She says, call your nurses and cancel them. Put them off another week. Assemble the board of trustees of the AMA and figure out how you're going to settle this case. You have lost. Let me tell you what bothers me as the single biggest tragedy of this whole thing. It wasn't so much chiropractors. I survived and flourished and had a very successful practice, as did thousands of my colleagues. What plagues me every day was literally the millions of people who never went to a doctor of chiropractic because they had been brainwashed into believing that chiropractic was not credible. There are some things that are forgivable and some things that are not. I can't tell you how many times patients would come to me in desperation after they had been everywhere and would say, if I only would have known about chiropractic sooner. On October of 09, I was in the process of going downtown to come back up and take my daughter to lunch. And uh, it was raining terribly hard and I hit the hydroplane, and by doing so, my car shifted to the center of the meridian and flipped about five times, and they found me in the back seat. My neck was broken, face was fractured, etc. I was lifted to the hospital, and uh, apparently I was in a coma for four weeks. I end up with rotary cuff damages on both hands, where I couldn't use my hand to a full extent. One of the issues that I'm having, other than getting out of bed and um, changing my clothes, is that if I want to move around the house and put on a light, like in this case, if I were to put on this light switch, I have to go like this, and it's paining, but I'll be able to move it once I get there, and then I'll have to assist my hand to bring it back down. They interviewed me, and they took x-rays, etc., and the doctor came up to the conclusion that I will need surgery, and if it doesn't work later on, they probably have to replace my rotary cuff, and that, that scared me. So I decided that I'll do some more research 
and see if I can find an alternative. And that's how I end up finding Dr. Murphy. What I want you to do is keep your shoulder back, your palms facing forward. Bring just your left arm as high as you can bring it. Okay. Okay? And stop there. Okay? If you would. Bring it up. Keep it coming. Push it as hard as you can. It's painful right there. Is that all you can do? Yeah. A frozen shoulder is a puzzling condition. Its path is idiopathic, which means they don't know what causes it. It comes on mysteriously, and it leaves just as mysteriously. The patient is unable to bring their arm up alongside their head. They, they only have about 90 to 120 degrees of what we call abduction. All right, so slowly, let's go ahead and abduct the arms. Bring them up over your head. Right there becomes difficult. Yes. So bringing it up alongside your ear is very difficult. It's not going to go. Point. They do physical therapy that makes them worse, that makes them hurt more and sleep less. Also, a lot of patients get the injection, which is ineffective most of the time. It keeps getting done, but it's not fixing the problem. And a patient came into my office. She said to me, I've decided to have surgery. And I said to her, well, I don't think that that's going to fix your problem, but I totally understand that you want out of this pain. Before you jump to this, I want to examine you in a new way. And I'm looking for that loss of springy end feel or function. The trapezius muscle, the upper and middle trapezius muscles, run by a cranial nerve that's found in the brainstem. And I thought to myself, well, if the trapezius was at the heart of this and it wasn't functioning and wasn't helping rotate that scapula upward, it may be a weakening or a malfunction of the spinal accessory nerve, this cranial nerve number 11. Okay, so the arms forward, and let's see how, how high they'll come up now. Okay, can you bring it all the way? No. Okay. But that's right. pretty darn good. All right, right, let's relax here. Okay, and back down again. I want you to use the motion a few times because it's been six months since it's gone up at all. Is that right? Yeah. And now I have this paradigm that I built in my head that the skull and the spine support a part of the nervous system that runs the shoulder. And go ahead and bring the arms up. See if they'll come all the way up. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, I'm not kidding this thing that had been around for so long that people knew nothing about was being resolved with this chiropractic adjustment. And so I began to get the word out that I've had some success with frozen shoulder and I wanted to see more of them and so people started sending me frozen shoulders and I went over to Best Buy and I got myself a video camera and I started videotaping one after another after another. Frozen shoulder was being resolved through this specific analysis and type of treatment. It's bad when you stop thinking about how to solve the problem or even better prevent the problem and then you just deal with the repercussion of the problem. And this is what healthcare has become. Uh, we have bad nutrition in America. So rather than work really hard at educating people what good nutrition is and how to exercise and keep yourself healthy, we'd rather have statin drugs, high blood pressure drugs, diabetes drugs, and so on. They have taken over the what I would consider really true health care, which is prevention first and then getting back to normal that honors the homeostasis or the natural balance that the body is always trying to maintain. From the moment I entered chiropractic college, what I realized was the public perception of chiropractic was very different for people who had not been to a chiropractor than it was for people who had been to a chiropractor. That I think one of the greatest things we suffer from is not a lack of evidence, but a lack of awareness of that evidence. The only way that we're gonna solve the problem that we have, and the problem that we have isn't results, the problem that we have isn't patient satisfaction, the problem that we have is public trust. No one knows how the spine and nervous systems function better than a chiropractor. And I believe that it is the chiropractor's job, the chiropractic profession's job, to educate people appropriately as to what chiropractic can offer them as it relates to their overall health and well-being. We have been ridiculed. We have been violently opposed. We as chiropractors understand, and those who have had great benefits from chiropractic understand, that it is self-evident. Chiropractic works. Chiropractic does what the chiropractor says it does.
I think it's unfortunate but true that the average public doesn't really understand at all the level of training and the level of education that a doctor of chiropractic undergoes. It's a four-year program, postgraduate, same length as medical school. The residency training is different, but the core training is essentially the same length. The first two years is over the same exact material. It's all the basic sciences, you know, biochemistry, microbiology, pathology, none of that changes. It's unfortunate that the public doesn't really understand that. I certainly think part of that is because of the public disinformation campaign, if you will, that, that went on for 20 plus years. The downside of that is many of them don't even consider chiropractic as an option for them. If people believe what they, what the, the information that's been deliberately put out by people who want to keep us out of healthcare. If they believe that information, then what they believe is that chiropractic has no evidence, that uh, there's much greater evidence for medical intervention, for drugs or for surgery. That's not true. The most evidence-based intervention available is chiropractic care for spinal health. I've seen a tremendous shift in the public perception and acceptance of chiropractic. I think part of it is the wide acceptance and utilization of chiropractic uh, doctors in professional sports teams. When they see professional athletes going to chiropractors, when they see professional sports teams with chiropractors on staff, they go, hey, this must work or they would not be doing it. I went to the University of Utah on a full ride scholarship and I kept being plagued with a problem with my foot. And every time I tried to push the next level, my foot would break down and I'd be in the training room trying to find answers and doing ice and stim and all the things they told me to do. And nothing really worked. And I had struggled with migraine headaches my whole life. And a friend of mine suggested I see a chiropractor. Now at the time, you know, we all grew up thinking chiropractors were quacks and they were dangerous, and so we just avoided chiropractors. But I had pretty much exhausted everything medicine had to offer, and so I thought, why not? It's worth a shot. And what was interesting is he did an exam on me, which no one had ever done, took x-rays, which no one had ever done. So he treated me that day for my headaches, and in passing, I mentioned my foot again. So he laid me back down on the table, evaluated the foot, and adjusted the foot. And I got off the table pain-free for the first time in five years, and I was shocked. All this pain, everything I had gone through, and one adjustment, my pain was gone. And that's when I really decided that chiropractic was something that I needed to look into. Okay, bring your knee up, please. Let me have your arm up and locked right here. I'm gonna pull, resist, pull it. Okay, pull tight. It's just been this amazing evolutionary process of discovering new ways of approaching athletic injuries, new ways of approaching patient conditions that people can't find answers for in the medical model. So how'd you do? You went skiing today, right? I did, okay. yeah. How was, was it? Well, the upper body is feeling okay, but I'm definitely feeling it in my knees again. There's no clicking or locking, but there's instability, and that's what's making me nervous. As an athlete, you rely on your body for everything. It becomes your means, it's your vehicle. And um, I can remember when I first met Dr. Bueller, um, uh, it was post ACL reconstruction. I was embarrassed and I was angry and I was confused after a year of therapy with qualified people that I was still this inhibited. I found out that so much stuff was shut down and I had so many imbalances. I'm gonna pull and you resist, pull tight. Pull up, nice. I had some really profound adjustments and some really amazing experiences with him. I knew I could then go out and actually ask of my body to give me an Olympic performance. I moved to Salt Lake and opened up a practice and two months after I opened it, I got a phone call from a chiropractor that I was leasing space from asking me if I would be interested in talking to a trainer for a basketball team. And that was my entry into the Utah Jazz where I served for 26 years. That opened up a lot of doors for a lot of chiropractors because other teams would call the Jazz and talk to the trainer to see you know, what kind of relationship he had with me. And because it was positive, then they would end up bringing chiropractic into their organizations. So you came to the Jazz and you're like all rookies, you're invincible, and you didn't need a trainer. And I remember the first year or two, I never saw you. No, no. I, you'd have seen me standing outside your door looking in. I watched you work with uh, Mark Eaton and, 
Adrian Dantley, and I, I just said, there's just no way I'm ever going in there. But uh, I certainly found my way into the room. Yeah. You got on my table, and you asked me if you had to believe in it for it to work. Remember that? Yeah. I said no. Yeah. If this was faith healing, we were in deep trouble because <laughs> I wasn't a believer. That's true. For sure. When I came in, I walked in your office one day with a limp. This is kind of when right. you and I really ramped up our experiences together. Is I was limping around. I had taken an anti-inflammatory for almost a year and a half for a, a little tendonitis in my, uh, by my ankle. And I uh, limped into your office to get adjusted before a road trip, and you asked me about the ankle. I said, well, what's going on? I said, don't worry about it. It's tendonitis. It's under control. We're handling it. And he said, well, you mind if I touch? I said, you can try to touch it, but you can't. You're not going to be able to find anything. You can't palpate it because nobody else could. And, Remember, you touched me in five spots that were hot as a boil, and I jumped off the table, and, and you said, well, that's the five attachments to the peroneus tertius. And I said, you know what that is? You said, yeah. Would you like me to fix it? And I said, absolutely. You did your work on it, and I walked out of there pain-free, never limped again, I refused to take the anti inflammatories after that. There's just no need for them. And, and so uh, that was really where you and I um, started our long and uh, great experiences. Front court left, Stockton falls down, and Stockton is hurt. He's hurt. His ankle. And you trust me, he is hurt. He never will take a step of the way. It's probably one of the most severe ankle sprains I've seen. In fact, I'd never seen an injury that they had to help him off, but he was in some significant pain. They took him in the locker room, the orthopedic surgeon evaluated him, ruled out a fracture, and I went to work. It was pretty ugly, and you're right, I got helped off there, and you start testing the perineal muscles on my ankle and my foot just shook terribly and mm -hmm. you couldn't put any pressure on it at all. It just was, it, it was awful. I believe you adjusted it immediately. You worked, uh, did some muscle work on a couple of perineal muscles. Then you tested my ankle again. My ankle, my foot didn't shake and it was strong. It didn't move. And so everybody kind of looked at each other like, did that just happen? Of course, you and I expected it. Yeah. He got off the table, walked pain-free, ran pain-free. They taped his ankle and he finished the fourth quarter. I don't think that's the ridiculous part. The part that's impressive to me is the next night I was able to play pain-free. Yeah. And that's after finishing the game on, a, on an acutely sprained ankle that was pretty bad. If you let the body guide the process and you just continue to clear muscles and balance the body, the body's capable of some pretty amazing healing in a really short period of time. Once we reset the joint, reactivate the muscles, walking and running becomes therapeutic. And we saw that numerous times through your career. Not everybody has that treatment. Um, not everybody can be kept balanced like you kept me balanced. So things didn't have a, t have a chance to grate and wear down and erode. Mm -hmm. If something bad happened like the sprained ankle, I didn't have to adapt around it. We got it back online and, and I could play not only pain-free, but free from the worry that I was gonna hurt myself worse. You know, I have my aches and pains, but largely I'm in pretty good shape for a guy that played 19 years, or even for a guy that played eight years. The Jazz had the lowest injury rate of any team in the NBA over a 20-year period that I had access to the players. The league average, if you take all the injury rates, was like 141, and the Jazz injury rate was 61. I know you fought some battles for me. Yeah, because I was committed to the treatment, and I thought everybody should be committed to the treatment. I mean, this works. If something works, why aren't we pushing it? Why aren't we pushing it? I'd been suffering from major knee pain. I broke my right leg, had a rod inserted. Nothing was working. Basically, I was skiing on one leg all year long. I came in just with the attitude of anything could help because I love it. I love skiing. I was in so much pain and then I got worked on by you. I got off the table and instantly pain-free. It was pretty amazing. When you're young and you're an athlete, you don't know. You think you're invincible. You think, I'm not going to get hurt. I'm young. I'm going to be the best on the team forever. I mean, I felt that. And then all of a sudden, things start to go wrong. And if you just do the status quo, if you just do what you're told, that's not enough. 40 years ago, to have the injury you had, it would have been a career ender. Yeah. You won a bronze medal after having two knee surgeries. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty mind-boggling. Yeah start adding this to the mix, which takes it to a different level, yeah. to where you get athletes back faster, more stable, more balanced. I really felt like that was an advantage. Wow, there's a lot of people that can go see Dr. Bueller. How many of them do? Zero. I do. In my head, that is competitive advantage. You had an injury eight weeks out from the Olympic Games. My concussions. Concussions, <laughs> yes. But I remember you couldn't do one-legged squat without falling over. Historically, when a person has a concussion like that, it takes months to get back. But 
The way I felt afterwards was incredible. It was the first time that I felt like I could think almost, like there yes. was this pressure off of my head and yeah, just open. I remember it was so amazing the night of the competition and, uh, and you won it all. And to go from a concussion or three concussions to be able to do that, to me it was like a miracle. Yeah, we did it. It's funny because, you know, people give the credit to the athlete, but really no one can get to where they are without their team. And everyone has a team behind them and you can't do it without them. Which really speaks to the value of an integrated approach. It takes a team approach, like you said, with a good medical staff, good physical therapist to do the rehab, but then someone who understands the dynamics of the neuromusculoskeletal system yeah. to be able to, one, find where your instabilities are and then correct them so that it gives you 100% access to every system in your body, yeah. which pays huge dividends and creates a competitive advantage. We take these manageable conditions like low back problems or, or headaches and we funnel all these drugs into the body with no knowledge of the effect and people get sicker and more dependent and before long they're stuck. One of the downsides of drug therapy is it, it doesn't allow the body to express itself, it suppresses itself. It, it dominates the biochemistry. And I think that's really a travesty when it comes to the healing process. But just that openness, that empathetic energy that goes on between physician and patient is incredibly healing. And I think medicine has lost track of that in a lot of ways. The biggest contradiction in our culture today is calling medicine healthcare. Medicine is not healthcare, it's sick care. And when you take sick care and provide it to a culture like healthcare, then you end up with a sick culture. And that's why we spend $2.7 trillion per year on what we call healthcare, and we're incredibly sick as a culture. I don't think any of us would have a problem spending that much money if we got results, but we're not getting the results for that investment. We're not gonna be able to afford these choices. It's a simple, basic reality. It's a fatally flawed system that eventually, most experts believe, will crash. And then we're gonna to have to rely on solutions that truly address the foundational causes of the healthcare problems that people are facing. Every year, 125,000 people die from properly prescribed prescription drugs. One of the things that the medical world is really, really good at is giving you the diagnosis. I'm not sure that they're as good as giving you a good individualized treatment plan because it seems like everybody's trying to give a cookbook program. If you have fibromyalgia, you get treatment A. If you have mixed connective tissue disease, you get treatment B. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, you get treatment C. You're now held to a certain standard of care created by these very industries, the insurance and drug world. And if you're not following that standard of care, you can have sanctions against your license, you can lose your license, you can not get coverage for the patient. I mean, there's all this pressure put on the system. And I think we were asleep at the wheel for a few decades. And now we're sort of coming up dusting ourselves off and looking around and saying, how did this happen? We're giving them an opportunity to actually improve function and get them to the point where they need uh, the least amount of medication as possible, working with their prescribing physician to do that. I think as a society and as a society of physicians, we've got comfortable with the fact that the quickest and easiest way to mitigate that pain is through the form of a pill, as opposed to other alternative means of pain reduction and that requires effort. That requires me taking time with you. It frustrates me to no end that I am part of a system that is broken and doesn't work. There's the science behind medicine which we can all learn. Then there's the art of medicine which many never learn and I'm afraid that that's an art that's dissipating quickly. Uh, if we don't do something about it, it's going to be lost art. You can look at different studies that have been done but the average doctor-patient face-to-face -face time in that sort of standard insurance model practice environment is roughly averages about six minutes. There's issues of the patient's diet, their social uh, structure that they live in, uh, the stress that they're under. You can't get into those kind of things in six minutes. Why is someone sick? Doing the right kind of exam, the right kind of history, intervening with them in their lifestyle, doing the right kind of tests to really investigate their personal biochemistry and physiology and where it's going wrong. 
That really just often, unfortunately, does not happen. Patients get frustrated with that, so they start looking for other answers. And that's where they're often driven to these other types of providers or these other types of care models. Chiropractic has been great for my family. When I was growing up, I don't recall my father ever taking a vacation to take a vacation. He loved his work and he says, when I can't work, I don't want to be here. He worked up to within a week when he passed away. Now we're into the fourth generation. My son says, I was destined to be a chiropractor because I was born September the 18th, which is official birthday of chiropractic. And we named him Jason, which means healer. So he says, I was destined to be a chiropractor. Biggest philosophies from learning from my dad, you can never ever rest on your laurels. That you can, it's always continual, never ending improvement. And, and whatever works for the patient is really your loyalty. And I think the, the most important thing that I learned from him was he said, you know, damn the torpedoes. You know, it doesn't matter what the medical community thinks of you. It doesn't matter what the other chiropractic community thinks of you. It doesn't matter what the nature paths or the acupunctures. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks of you. As long as you're getting improvement in the patient, as long as you're helping the patient. It used to bother me at first when people would say, you know, hey, are you a real doctor? Um, you know, you're, you're crazy, you're a quack, you're a kook, etc." And it used to really bother me. Gosh, Dad, you know, this patient came in and, and their brother-in-law said that, you know, I'm not a real doctor, I don't want to do this. And, and my dad would say, is the patient getting better? Are you helping them? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're helping them. But you doing what they're, what they're saying? And he's like, that is irrelevant. Your mission in life is to help the person that's in front of you. The only way to handle a, a patient that has your type of symptoms is we have to balance everything on every level. We have to make sure that you're balanced biochemically, biomechanically, hormone tests, uh, do everything we can uh, emotionally and make sure that we have good nutritional support to the nerve system. I mean, you are what you eat, so we want to make sure that what you're eating is good and also what you're absorbing is good. I said, Jason, you ever thought of going to medical school or osteopathic school to have a full license? He says, yeah, Dad, I've thought about it, but I can't be a hypocrite. I was raised differently. It, you depend upon natural things before you do upon drugs. My dad had uh, prostate cancer. Um, I believe he was diagnosed in 2003, 2004. And he decided to do a radiation seed implant with external beam radiation. And after those treatments, his physiology was never the same yet. He, he developed severe ulcerative uh, colitis. And we learned later that uh, that is one of the side effects of the external beam radiation. I love my work. Uh, I think it's spilled over into the family. It was passed on to me. Uh, I just love to help people. Yeah, I could have retired some time ago, but I'd rather work than retire. My dad went into the hospital December 20th and then passed away December 27th from hepatorenal syndrome, which means that the liver and the kidneys fail at the same time. And, um, you know, we were in the hospital and, and we were going through the treatment, learning about all of our recommendations and stuff like that. And, and he looked at me and he said, hey, you know, son, I've had a good run. It's time to go home. And so we took him home and, and he passed away at home December 27th. His philosophy on being a doctor was because we were the new kids on the block. He said, you have to be better at everything in order for us to really pave the way for the next generation of chiropractors. You've got to look better. You've got to look like a doctor. You've got to have better documentation. You've got to have better bedside manner. You've got to have better patient skills because that's what it takes to be successful. We're looking for a way of communicating to the, not only health professionals, but to the population at large in ways that are consistent with our highest goals and aspirations. We need to respect our patients and the general public. We need to find ways to speak to them and to explain this sometimes obscure and complicated science that all the health professionals are involved with in ways that they can understand. That is way easier said than done. I understand that. Evan, what did you do at Aunt Kristen's house?
Did you play with blocks? No talking. Bevan was slow to talk, wasn't really showing any interest in playing with brothers and sisters or kids in the neighborhood. The suggestion was to get him seen by a developmental pediatrician and a team of therapists. They said I would just have to come to grips with the fact that he was going to go to school and get a job or live someplace where he needed help. The prognosis, the what to do was good luck. They called us on the way home. I said, get that kid in here, let's get him figured out. And we did our examination. Evan was a classic subluxation case. He had a rough birth and other things that occurred, and the top of his neck, the first and second cervical vertebrae, were very, very stressed. And there was a lot of pressure resulting in that onto his nervous system. And what it did is it kept his nervous system in a state of perpetual fight or flight, in a perpetual state of stress. When they get stressed and they get stuck in stress, they don't develop appropriately. Where are we? Dr. Tony. <gasps> Dr. Tony? I go inside. Yeah? We sat him down, made an adjustment, and it was the adjustment that allowed him to go back into that growth and development stage that a kid innately should be in. Dr. Tony, yay! Yeah. I don't talk. What's that? A truck. A truck? It was such little adjustments to his nervous system to make such huge gains. His third birthday, he had maybe five words. Five words, yeah. A month later, it was pages of words. Where are we going? What are we doing? I'm to the bus. We're going to the bus. Where does the bus take you? Whoa. Oh, the bus takes you to school. Seeing the vacant look in Evan's eye and knowing that something wasn't right and seeing that go away is incredible. Hi. How are you? Good. These individual cases cannot be considered to be scientific proof. You can't generalize from them and yet they open up in our minds an enlarged sense of what is possible. What if chiropractic helps 10%? A randomized controlled trial says there's no benefit, but for that individual patient, there's a benefit. How do you spell Evan? E. What? E. Yeah. A. Uh huh. N. So how do we deal with that? First, we never claim genuine evidence that chiropractic has been scientifically proven to help the majority of cases of whatever the visceral condition is. Second, it is legitimate, assuming it is spoken honestly, to say to a patient or a potential patient, there are some individuals with this condition who appear to have been helped by chiropractic care. It only takes one white crow to prove that not all crows are black. It's a pretty simple equation. Chiropractic first, medicine second, surgery third. Always the least invasive, least harmful method first, and then you work your way up. You don't start with the surgical situation. You don't start with the side effects of medication. You start with the possibility of the most conservative effect first. There's too much money in keeping people sick. There's no money in keeping people well. The chiropractor is a gatekeeper. We can put the patient on a nutritional program exercise program, things that the medical field are not doing, and we can actually look at this patient and decrease their costs. Medicare is a, the largest health care system, and in general, people are very satisfied with it. Our seniors go to their doctors, and they're covered for most conditions. And with chiropractic being a more natural approach to care, many seniors would like to start there first. The problem is that with Medicare, they only cover three codes for doctors of chiropractic out of 10,000. That means the patient is limited by what they can get reimbursed for. The insurance industry is often run by medical physicians. So the payment scheme that they've developed tends to go towards that direction. It doesn't really make anyone a lot of money if a patient can go to a doctor of chiropractic get some naturally based treatment such as an adjustment, some nutritional advice, and talk about exercise. There's not a lot of money in that, but it's awfully good for the patient. We look at someone from head to toe, 
not only what their pathology is, if areas have been injured, but what their functional integrity is. It comes back to observations that were made over 100 years ago where neurological function was increased without using drugs or surgery specifically by an adjustment. In talking about chiropractic philosophy, what's central to our practice is the nerve system. We know the nerve system controls and coordinates all the cells, tissues, and organs in the body and adapts the body to the environment. How all the parts internally talk to each other. What we do is try to find out where is their nervous system interfered with and then how do we eliminate that interference so their body can begin to work better. It goes back to this notion of philosophy. Are you there to try to manipulate the body into something you want it to be? Or are you there to get rid of the interferences so that it can work the way it's intended to work? The literature shows the effectiveness of chiropractic manipulation. It decreases patients' pain. It decreases the need for medication. The pharmaceutical company is backing medical school, so they're basically taught how to suppress symptoms using pharmacology. They're being trained this way. We had four years of training of nutrition, and so we know that's a huge part of how the body heals. The public deserves evidence-based care. They deserve to have access to the most evidence-based intervention available, to the safest intervention available, to the most cost-effective intervention available. Nobody owes us anything. People owe the public something. And what they owe the public is to make policy based on evidence. What medical doctors owe their patients is to make recommendations or referrals based on evidence. The medical profession looks from a pathoanatomical point of view when they look at an x-ray and MRI. In other words, they want to see something wrong with the anatomy. That's why they can find a degenerator or abnormal herniated disc and say, there, right there, I can prove it to you. CCC on this x-ray MRI, and they'll do their fusion. But what do they do? They fuse you in a misaligned position. Your physiology, your functioning has not improved whatsoever. Fail back surgery is so prevalent now that it, the insurance has its own code, fail back surgery syndrome. What they're doing is just drugging them, shooting them, cutting them, and then we see the after effects. I had a man come into my office the other day who had eight back surgeries. He didn't need one of them. 50 to 90 percent of back surgeries fail according to the medical men themselves. I had a dream where I woke up in cold sweats and I was in hell. All the people there with me in hell were all the patients that received surgical procedures from me that didn't really need it and their lives were destroyed because of it. Every time I go into the operating room, it's uncomfortable in many ways because you're turning the patient's lives upside down and you're worried, is this going to really provide the relief for this patient that we've hoped for? In Soviet Union, and I'm from Belarus, every child was going through the screening of the spine. And it was in the first grade when I was looked at by the doctor and they said, oh, this child has scoliosis. And for me as a child, I was really scared. There was two solutions, either going surgical or going natural. And effects of the surgery could be devastating for this child function. The correction involved stainless steel rods that basically screwed into the bones in the spine to the vertebrae. Stainless steel doesn't grow, so it's a multiple surgeries, three or four, until I reach full level of maturity. I wouldn't play sports. Probably I would have academic dysfunctions too, because after each surgery I would need spinal rehabilitation. It was advised that maybe something else should be done and we didn't have a chiropractor per se, but the doctor was a surgeon who did not practice surgery, he practiced chiropractic. The doctor said, we're gonna adjust this boy and he's gonna start doing some exercises and he's gonna have better life. I became elite level athlete. I swam for the National Soviet Union and Belarusian swimming team. It was amazing. My life was literally saved considering alternatives for this. Considering the spinal, multiple spinal surgery, considering what would happen to me. Because I believe that it changed my life, I want that for everyone. There is an epidemic of back pain. It's a yes. billion dollar issue. We wind up with people not being able to function, they get depressed, they get hooked on pain medications of which are freely available. If there had been proper organized, coordinated intervention, an integrated kind of a, an approach to that person may have saved that individual from what I consider to be a life of despair. I agree with you. I think a large percentage of those patients would have been helped by earlier intervention, more holistic approach as far as 
diet, exercise, and avoiding this illness circle that they've gotten into. I see more and more patients coming in. They tell me, you know, I saw my mom, I saw my dad, I saw that road that they went down. I don't want to go down that road. I want to take a different direction. Patients need to take responsibility for this. Ask questions, become involved, be a proactive part, be their own advocate, because that's what's really missing. If you were to ask me about 30 years ago when I was a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania, if I were going to be seeing a chiropractor as the main healthcare provider in my, my life, I probably would have said you were nuts. As an allopathic physician, we really had no experience with chiropractic medicine. Well, after eight years of residency and being on call every other night and doing eight and 10 hour operations, it took only about another couple of years in practice. And I found out what about every other surgeon finds out, which is that doing surgery is very hard on your spine. I really thought only two years into my practice that my career was gonna be over. Uh, I can remember coming home at night in so much pain. I remember saying to my wife, I said, I don't think I'm gonna make this. I think I'm gonna have to switch careers. For the past 20 years, you really have become the main healthcare provider for what has basically kept me in practice. It's been very interesting for me, this, this transformation within this profession, and really within the allopathic profession, who just, you know, 15 to 20 years ago was a whole different scenario in terms of their, their perception of chiropractic, their understanding of chiropractic, and their acceptance. Well, I think it's important for patients in our community, all communities, to understand that there's a lot more that we can do to benefit their health than simply operating or giving medications. And I think that the world of chiropractic comes a long way in that integration, and I think it's crucially important for the patient's well-being. Many of us are moving into this realm where it's a team. We approach problems from multiple angles, just like any disease is multifaceted. It's just plain good care. It should be a joint process of physicians from different disciplines working together to create a paradigm of what we're capable of producing in this country. We need to do what's best for the patient. None of us are trained to know everything in every scenario. It's just impossible. There's too much to know these days. So it really does take a team or it takes a village or whatever kind of way you want to say that. And that's our model of training here at the University of Bridgeport. We have people being trained in a wide variety of healthcare professions, whether it's chiropractic, whether it's naturopathic medicine, whether it's physician assistant, whether it's nursing. All of these providers are in many cases learning together and they're interacting with one another while they're being trained. In their clinical training, they're having integrative clinic shifts so they learn how to work as a team to come up with a rational treatment plan that's best for the patient. And that's really where healthcare is trying to go with the new construct, it's just a big change. So if we could line up the expectations of the modern patient and the training of the modern healthcare provider, then we're truly gonna have a changed healthcare system but it's going to have to involve a shifting of the way healthcare providers are trained across the nation. And that includes chiropractic education and all provider education as well. Was the AMA concerned about the encroachment of chiropractic into the field of medicine? We were concerned about the activities of the American Chiropractic Association and the harm it was doing by uh, attempting to masquerade as a separate and distinct health care service for the people. The Will case ended in 1987. I had been practicing, my dad was still practicing, we were practicing together at that time, and I remember how proud he was uh, that we were vindicated, especially when that federal judge found them guilty of an illegal boycott that was designed to ruin the reputation of a competitor. Those were strong words. I was president of the American Chiropractic Association when the Wilkes lawsuit was filed. And our legal counsel said, you'll never beat the AMA. Well, fortunately, a group of five or six had lockjaw and they hung on to the case. It took 15 years to win the case. I think what happened with our profession it is that we stood up at the time. We're not gonna take this anymore. You're not gonna demean a whole profession because of competition, because you're afraid of who's gonna get the dollar from that patient. That's not what healthcare is all about. We're not ever gonna let that happen. 
So I think the chiropractic profession became emboldened by that case. The mechanics and posture have to be correct. You don't want to bend forward. You got to use those knees. All the things you've been taught over the many years, starting with my dad. When Jack came, Dr. Flynn, chiropractic was very early in public acceptance and they were having to uh, really put up a fight. He had a lot of zeal for uh, being helpful, not just to himself, but to chiropractic. Look where we are today. The work of a chiropractor is very, very respected. It's working in integrative settings. Almost every college and professional athlete has a chiropractor on standby. I mean, it's just an important part of healthcare. I'm a first generation chiropractor, and, and he's a second generation chiropractor. He has a legacy. Our forefathers, the people that came before us in the last hundred years, were persecuted, put in jail. Mike Flynn was around all that as a child. His father had to deal with these types of things. But they stayed the course. They stayed strong. They believed in truth, and they followed that line very carefully, closely. And in the end, it won out. They weren't going to be afraid of, of society if they were going to snub their noses at them because the medical profession, political medicine, was telling them that they were bad news. It was that type of courage that went along with the belief system. They saw every day that the spinal manipulations, the adjustments that we call to the structural system, balancing the body, made a huge difference in a lot of people's lives, took away their pain without medicine. Human suffering was alleviated. And that kind of inspired each and every one, and it inspires us today in the profession, that what we do has great meaning. How many years ago did they say they wanted to do back surgery on you? 35 years ago. 35 years ago. Yeah, I remember that day you drove in on your motorcycle. You had a head of hair like a lion. Well, what was that, a, a truck accident back then? Is that when you yeah. had that head-on collision? Yeah. And the steering wheel went up into your chest. I still remember that. Yeah. Mike is such a good leader. He knows how to reach people, how he treats people, how he talks to people, how he presents himself, not just as a professional, but as a caring person. Now, you got a rodeo this weekend? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Put your head face down. How have you been feeling? You're shooting, is that right? What do you shoot? Now, are you riding a horse a lot as well? No. no, you're not riding as much anymore? How about you? Have you been eating fruits and vegetables and drinking enough water? So does it have much of a kick on your shoulder? Have you fallen off the horse lately? Uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? <laughs> Look, you had a funny. You're just growing so tall. Lots of, headaches, Lots of headaches? Or are you giving your dad headaches? If you have problems with your patients, it's because you're not loving them enough. They don't understand what you're really contributing to their life. This natural healing, this non-narcotic, non-surgical way, my function is to help people achieve and maintain optimal health. I feel oftentimes like a player on a stage that's being guided to move this profession to the level that it should be at so that the public recognize the power behind the body's ability to heal. But we've got an even better opportunity to educate patients about options. If people don't have options, then they're stuck with that medical model. At the end of the day, we have to realize that the thing that we need to do is not fight for the right to practice chiropractic, but fight for the right of people to receive it. The whole mindset of healthcare is starting to get refocused in a very patient-centered, evidence-based, directed healthcare in which the patient has choices to make. And it's the choices that they didn't have before that, in my mind, is going to change the landscape of the way healthcare is delivered. Many times in our profession we say, I didn't choose to be a chiropractor. Some way, chiropractic chose me. And I think that's happening with a new generation. Chiropractic schools are going to be filled to the capacity, and they're almost there now. And it's because a lot of young men and women, they want to serve their fellow human being. And they don't want to serve them by writing a prescription. They want to serve them by giving them some sound advice. Sound advice on nutrition. Sound advice on exercise. Sound advice on how to deal with stress. These are things that doctors of chiropractic are skilled and trained to deliver. Chiropractors today have that passion that my dad had. I see it all the time. They understand that what I do is very, very important. Oh, you check out real good. Let me see your arms here. Just let me just kind of let it fall, let it fall. The future of healthcare in this country, I believe, is going to be chiropractic first, drugs second, and surgery third. And I think in that order, it's going to be very important. 
it's going to be a healthier world with chiropractors being the first portal of entry to evaluate a person's condition. All the research is going to prove that point. Oh my, did you need that. <laughs> In fact, that's the best you've ever adjusted, I think. You did good. All right, who's next? <laughs>